What do you say, everybody? It's time for Monday Night Quarterback, and you know what that means. Football season is right around the corner. I'm Mick Gillespie with Andrew Bone. We're going to talk some recruiting here on Monday Night Quarterback. We're going to do this throughout the entire football season, and uh, this is my first show back in a while. Great to see you again, Bone. Good to see you, man. We've uh, we've certainly missed you around these parts. Hey, look, uh, same same with me. Uh, you know, football season is exciting, and I kind of slide out and do a little baseball. But I'm ready for Alabama, and you've been covering recruiting through the summer as well. So we're going to talk about that, and I want to remind everyone that Monday Night Quarterback is brought to you by Westgate Condominiums. And when you're in Tuscaloosa and you're near Alabama football, the place that you want to go and swing and check out is Westgate because these Westgate luxury condominiums are right next to Bryant-Denny Stadium. You can hear the touchdowns from your patio. It's uh, really amazing. When you walk outside and you smell the air and you and you hear the sounds and all that stuff. So next time you come to Tuscaloosa, think about it. Westgate, you can check out more information at BamaInsider.com and also at Westgate. So we talk football today, uh, Andrew, and we know that Alabama is got some new company as it's official today that not only Oklahoma, but Texas are part of the SEC. And when you talk recruiting, that's going to open up the door for Alabama because they've done so well in Texas. I don't know as much about Oklahoma, but Alabama reeled in a pair of commitments last week. Do you think that having Texas and Oklahoma is going to help out? Talk about Kobe, Patience, and Dane Shore. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, obviously a, a home run for the SEC, you know, getting you know, two premier programs. Uh, you know, like Oklahoma and Texas into the SEC, uh, obviously, is you know Alabama has done really well in the state of Texas. Uh, you know, is that going to have a negative or a uh, positive effect on it? You know, you just don't know. You, you, I think a lot of kids who've left the state of Texas and may have left the state of Oklahoma, you know, they wanted to play uh, in the SEC. Uh, so now they're they're going to have this chance. We, you know, will it uh, close the door on some of these SEC teams that have had some success uh, recruiting those states, or will it open it up even? more um you know we'll just ha- kind of have to wait and see but you know with alabama you know they're going to continue to recruit well um you know they've developed so many great relationships you know from a you know, high school standpoint you know relationships uh with different high school coaches uh you know just different people throughout these states uh they've been able to recruit you know i think you know that we're not going to see much of a drop off uh in terms of alabama's recruiting efforts uh in those states and you know it, it may even open up you know more opportunities for guys even outside of those regions you know, people that you know, may not have been thinking about playing in the SEC. Now they're seeing other programs coming in. Now they want to be a part of it. So it could open the door even more for uh, for those type of players. But, yeah, I mean, over the course of the last week, seen a couple more commitments for the Crimson Tide. Uh, Kobe Prentice, an in-state wide receiver uh, from Calera High School, jumped on board uh, last week. And then we saw over the weekend Dane Shore. Uh, offensive alignment out of Alpharetta, uh, Georgia, committing to the Crimson Tide. Now, both of these guys worked out at Alabama's camp this summer. So you know, these kids weren't taken blindly. Uh, you know, last year, you know, all Alabama really had to go off of for a lot of those kids uh, was film. You know, they had to evaluate these guys on film. Uh, you know, didn't really get a chance to you know, see guys in camp, evaluate them in person. This summer, this past June, they were finally able to do that. They saw a lot of these top kids. They were evaluating them. You know, there was a lot of five stars, a lot of four stars that were in Tuscaloosa throughout the summer that uh, participated in, in Alabama's camp and, you know, worked out, uh, you know, with their position coaches and in front of Nick Saban. And, you know, these are some of the guys that, you know, were evaluated and got the green light to commit. So uh, you, you have to give Alabama, uh, you know, definitely a lot of credit in terms of evaluating and wait, you know, really waiting because, you know, we didn't see a lot of commitments that happened during the spring. And we kept telling everybody, just wait until the summer, let Alabama, you know, get these kids on campus, let them evaluate this top football program in college football. They can wait. They can wait to evaluate these kids in person, whether that's a five-star, a kid in the top 100, or if it's a kid that nobody's ever even heard of. You want to get all these guys on campus, evaluate them, and then make your new recruiting board. You know, figure out who's really at the top of the list. They're not going to look at Rivals.com. They're not going to look at, you know, any of these other websites and say, you know, because that guy's a five-star, he's a five-star on our recruiting board. That's just not how it works. I know people think it works like that, but it just doesn't. Um, you know, there's going to be some kids that, you know, they've evaluated for the last couple of years that, 
those guys may be a five star and you know they may really want those kids but in the end they're going to make their own evaluations they're going to have their own big recruiting board they're going to have their own ranking so uh even though we may have seen some three stars that have jumped on board these guys aren't three stars in alabama's mind at all um and i, I think that's something that gets you know misplaced a little bit because i've seen some five stars that have come through tuscaloosa this year i've seen some rivals 100 kids that have come through tuscaloosa that alabama just isn't interested in anymore they came into town worked out at camp and hey you know they weren't you know, Alabama caliber players. And we've seen some three stars who get been given the green light to commit to Alabama. So, um, you know, you got to trust the coaching staff. So big, two big pickups for Alabama, of course, the last week, still think we're going to see some more commitments before the, uh, before the season starts. And, you know, some guys that I'm, you know, really kind of watching pretty closely over the course of the next few weeks, Barry and Brown out of Nashville rivals, 100 wide receiver, Kind of been on the commitment watch for Alabama for a while, but still think that there's some other schools out there that he's really interested in. He took an unofficial visit to Kentucky this past weekend. He really likes TCU, really likes Ole Miss. Those are some random schools that mm-hmm. Alabama's you know going up against. You usually see Alabama you know battling you know Georgia or Ohio State or Clemson or maybe Texas, LSU, Auburn, but you don't really see Alabama versus TCU, Alabama versus Ole Miss. But, you know, this kid uh, is a highly talented prospect and has visited all of these schools and, you know, really likes each one of these programs. So uh, I think Alabama still has a great chance to, uh, to land his commitment. Justice Finkley, who visited Alabama this past weekend, you know, another kid that I think, you know, could potentially be on Alabama's commitment list by the start of the uh, college football season. So we're watching him pretty closely. And then a third, Jake Pope, we've talked about him so many times throughout the last month in terms of, you know, when he's going to make a decision. Every time I've talked to him over the course of the last month, he said within the next two weeks. And then it's a week later, within the next two weeks, a week later, within the next two weeks. So, you know, he's just kind of, you know, being patient. You know, I don't think he knows for sure what he wants to do. He took an unofficial visit to Georgia this past weekend. You know, still kind of hearing Alabama and North Carolina really battling it out. Uh, for him right now, I'd still probably give the edge to Alabama, uh, but you know it's getting a little bit tighter in his recruitment. But we could see him making a decision before the start of the season. Andrew Bone, Mick Gillespie, this is Monday Night Quarterback Bone talking recruiting. Our show brought to you by Westgate Luxury Condominiums right there next to Bryant Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa. Bone, did you get the invite to the Champions Cookout this past weekend? You know, it's funny. We, you know, as an Alabama reporter for the last 18 plus years, uh, we have never gotten an invite to uh, any of these cookouts or, uh, or football camps or anything like that. And it's, you know, sometimes you, you look at Twitter over the weekend and when other schools have these functions, Friday night lights down in uh, uh, Florida, you have Texas, you know, with their uh, pool party cookout thing that they had on Friday night, some of these other programs, and you see different reporters who are there uh, taking photos, getting interviews in person. Trust me, it's a little bit more challenging to interview a lot of these top recruits when you're having to just call them rather than being there on campus, being able to interview them in person, it's a little bit more challenging, but, um, but yeah, um, you know, Alabama just doesn't allow that for some reason or another. Um, you know, they just don't allow uh, media to go to their camps, go to their, uh, you know, any of their recruiting events. So, uh, you know, we kind of have to work a little bit extra hard to, uh, to get, get the info, but who was there? Well, there's a lot of top players there, not, no meteor guys, but uh, but definitely a lot of top recruits who were in Tuscaloosa, and I, I had a chance to speak to a lot of those top guys. Um, you know, a lot of commitments. Um, you know, what we saw is, you know, a lot of kids. You know, this past weekend, a lot of t- kids took in visits that they haven't. You know, schools that they hadn't seen yet this summer. So we saw a lot of kids visit schools that they had not seen. But Alabama, we saw a lot of commitments who were in town. Ty Simpson, Emmanuel Henderson, uh, Jaheim Otis, Jeremiah Alexander. Antonio Kite, uh, Robert Woodyard, a lot of a lot of different commitments, but we also saw some uncommitted guys, some key targets for Alabama, including Earl Little Jr., who I had a chance to speak with. We have, have a great interview with him on BamaInsider.com right now, so I encourage Alabama fans go check that out. It's actually a free read on Bama Insider right now, but J- Earl Little Jr., uh, great trip to Tuscaloosa. He's still going to wait a little while, probably wait until November to make that decision, but still think Alabama's in the uh, in the driver's seat for him. Elijah Pritchett, four-star offensive lineman from Georgia. Alabama's still looking to add one more 
maybe two more offensive linemen in this year's class after getting a commitment from Tyler Booker and Dane Shore this month. Can they add another one in Elijah Pritchett? I think they can, uh, but it's a challenge. I mean, Florida State made a very strong impression on him here recently. Uh, also really likes Georgia. I think in the end it comes down to Alabama and Florida State for Elijah Pritchett. He's going to take in some games this upcoming season. Chaz Preston, four-star wide receiver out of Louisiana, was also in town. Had a great interview with him on BamaInsider.com uh, right now. Uh, you know, I, I think Alabama, you know, as of right now, currently has one wide receiver commitment in Kobe Prentice. Now, Mari Neblock uh, is a commitment as a wide receiver, but could potentially play tight end, could potentially play outside linebacker. So kind of consider him more as an athlete rather than a, than a wide receiver. But you know, I still think Alabama really would like to add a couple more receivers in this class. And Chaz Preston, you know, certainly one of uh, one of Alabama's top targets. Justice Finkley, as we talked about earlier, four-star defensive lineman, in-state kid, visited Alabama. Uh, it was his third visit to Tuscaloosa since April, attended the spring game, was back in Alabama in June, and then attended the uh, the cookout this past weekend. Still think Alabama or Texas, but leaning a little bit more towards Alabama with his uh, frequent tw- trips to Tuscaloosa. And, uh, you know, I think he's going to make a decision, you know, probably within the next month or so. So really watching Justice Chinkley. And then one actually guy who's committed elsewhere that was in town this past weekend, Marquise Graciel. Uh, he's a Mizzou commitment from Missouri. Uh, you know, doesn't really talk to the media much, keeps things pretty quiet. So we're not really sure, you know, where he stands after his weekend trip, but we know Alabama very interested in him, measuring in around six foot four, three hundred and fifteen pounds during his unofficial visit to Alabama. Uh, we'll see if he ends up maybe making a return trip to Alabama this fall for an official visit. But those are some of the top names who were in Tuscaloosa over the weekend. And uh, obviously, we have a lot of great content on BamaInsider.com right now with a lot of great interviews. Don't forget, our show is brought to you by the Westgate Luxury Condominiums right there next to Bryant Denny in Tuscaloosa. And as you can see, just amazing. The rooftop is brilliant right next to the football stadium. You can hear kickoff. You can uh, um, you can you almost feel the vibrations from the touchdowns that Alabama is going to score against teams like Tennessee and LSU. Maybe the Iron Bowl. Check them out. And we appreciate their support of our show. Uh, they're absolutely gorgeous. And they're right there next to um, Bryant Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa. All right, Bone, let's talk Crimson Tide D line commitments and guys that they might want to add to the mix. And there's one big target out of Detroit, Michigan. Yeah, over the weekend, Alabama extended an offer to Deion Walker out of Cast Tech in Detroit. Now, this is a big kid. He's six foot seven, 340 pounds. Imagine if Alabama is able to get him on board to go along with Jaheim Otis, who's six foot six, three hundred and sixty pound plus. That's, uh, that's a lot of a uh, you know, lot of a uh, lot of weight on that defensive front. So, you know, can they potentially get him on board? Now, he had a top five, named a top five a couple weeks ago, but after receiving his offer from Alabama on Sunday, uh, told me that Alabama, Michigan, and Kentucky are his top three schools. He's going to visit Alabama in the fall. He's not visited yet with his parents. Now, he visited on his own, but he's not visited with his parents. So he's going to bring his parents down to Tuscaloosa sometime this fall. There's a lot of really good defensive linemen who are out there that Alabama is heavily involved in. And most of these guys, besides Justice Finkley, we talked about Finkley earlier, potentially making a decision with them the next month. Now, we're obviously watching his recruitment very closely. Um, and we talked about Marquise Gracio making a trip down to Tuscaloosa. So that's kind of a guy that, you know, in terms of, you know, someone who's committed somewhere that we're going to be watching uh, over the next few months. But you know, there's just a lot of guys who are out there. Walter Nolan, five-star defensive lineman. Bear Alexander, another five-star. Both of those guys visited Alabama in June. Bear took an official visit. While Nolan just took an unofficial visit, plans on coming back to Tuscaloosa sometime in the fall. You have guys like Anthony Lucas, uh, Amari Abor, you know, a lot of guys – a lot of really talented guys that are uh, you know, that are high on Alabama recruiting board, but all of them plan on waiting. They plan. They, a lot of these guys are wanting to go to games, experience the game day atmosphere. And I've talked about this before. A lot of these guys took in their official visits last month. Usually, we see kids take official visits, then they make their commitments. Kind of going in reverse order this year because of COVID last year. You know, it caused everybody to wait until this past June to really take in their first you know experience. At, at these college campuses. So now they're wanting to wait a little bit longer 
go to some games, enjoy that experience, and then make decisions. So uh, we're going to see a lot of commitments you know, happen over the course of the next few months, but a lot of them are going to wait until the fall, uh, you know, maybe even closer to that early signing period to make their decisions. Bone, you're talking about just the way that COVID's changed things. Uh, August 1st was the official offer day for players in the 2022 class. What does that really even mean? Well, you know, everyone kind of freaks out about it. Oh, you know, when they see kids put out their graphics, they got an official offer from Alabama or Georgia or whoever it may be. There's still a pecking order. There's still an order of things, you know, just because you got that official offer graphic or you got something in the mail, it doesn't necessarily tie Alabama to taking a commitment uh, from these players. So, you know, I think it identifies them as, you know, legit targets. They are on Alabama's recruiting board or whatever board they may be on. You know, they may, may be Miami, might be Texas, might be USC. You know, they're getting these official offers and it's really recognizing them as top targets, as guys who are being recruited by Alabama or you know, where, what other school, any other schools out there in the country, but there's still a pecking order. You still have to, there's still a lot of guys who are out there that might have to wait their turn to, uh, to make a commitment uh, to the Crimson Tide or, you know, may need to still be seen a little bit more, this upcoming fall. So it really doesn't mean that much. We see a lot of guys get offered during the, uh, during the spring. And even before that, uh, and a lot of those offers that we saw during the spring are, those are what I like to call come to camp offers. Uh, some of them can commit, but a lot of them, you got to extend that offer to even get these, a lot of these kids to visit. And that's, that really goes on at, at most schools. Uh, you still got to get seen in person. You can't just get an offer and, I'll, I'll immediately commit to uh, to the school. You still have to get seen by the per, per, by the program. Head coaches still need to evaluate you. Um, and once you get on campus, you know maybe you do get evaluated enough where you do get that green light to commit. Or maybe they say you're really good. You have an offer from us, but we still need to see you play a little bit this fall before we give you that green light. Because keep in mind, Alabama coaches didn't see any of these guys play last fall. Right. They, they didn't go out and evaluate kids in person. So they've seen a lot of these kids on campus this summer without pads on. Now they want to go see them a little bit more with pads on. Andrew Bone, Mick Gillespie, final question for Bone here on Monday Night Quarterback. Something that you're going to see us do every single Monday throughout football season. And uh, we're cranking things up here as Alabama gets set to take on Miami in Atlanta. That's coming up right around the corner. One other guy, Bone, made his uh, top four list out of Philadelphia. How about Alabama going up to Philly to go after one of their top players, Anai White, and and he's got Bama, Texas A&M, Georgia, and Ohio State. So even though he's in Philadelphia, he's got a lot of Southern schools in there. Yeah, that's right. And, I, and there's always been this feeling that he was going to play in the SEC, but I know he really likes – Obviously, Ohio State a lot as well. And um, I think the biggest surprise when he announced that top four uh, was the elimination of Florida because Florida had been one of his top uh, schools for a while. And many people felt like he could end up potentially in Gainesville. But Gators are eliminated. He has a top four, visited all of those schools uh, last month, including Alabama. I think Alabama has a great chance with him, recruited mainly as an outside linebacker, edge type rusher and obviously Alabama picked up a uh, you know a tremendous uh, commitment a few weeks ago from Jeremiah Alexander they get Jeremiah Alexander paired up with the Nye White they'll have one heck of a uh, outside linebacker class but it's gonna be tough I mean you know there's certainly some programs that are uh, uh, you know heavily recruiting him heavily pushing to uh, to get his commitment and uh, you know probably using Alabama's numbers because they they against them because they recruited really well at the outside line linebacker position the last uh, last couple of recruiting classes but you know he remains a top target for Alabama and somebody that they are uh, you know certainly pushing for so we'll have to wait and see when that decision date comes nothing just yet but put out his top four on Sunday and um, in Alabama still in the mix best in the business Andrew Bone our recruiting expert here on Bama Insider the Alabama rival site our show Monday Night Quarterback presented by Westgate luxury condominiums right there next to Tuscaloosa and uh, well I say Tuscaloosa next to Tuscaloosa's gym where all the championships are won Bryant Denny Stadium right there on campus it's going to be great uh, hanging out there this year post game Alabama football Alabama and Miami coming up and Bones got us covered on recruiting thanks Bone thanks Mick welcome back thanks buddy
What do you say, everybody? With Tony Sukalis, I'm Mick Gillespie, and this is Monday Night Quarterback. And Monday Night Quarterback is what we do every Monday night when we talk about Alabama and what's going on around the SEC and college football. The Crimson Tide and Miami are coming up. Alabama defending national champs. And Monday Night Quarterback this year is brought to you by Westgate Luxury Condominiums right there next to Bryant-Denny Stadium. I mean, I'm talking about a stone's throw away. These are amazing. They took a lot of time and effort to build these amazing luxury condominiums, uh, and they're going to be fantastic. You want to be right next to Bryant-Denny. You want to be able to smell the hot dogs being cooked. You want to be able to hear the touchdowns, feel the vibrations. You want to live right there, smack dab in the middle of everything, Westgate Luxury Condominiums. They are prime property for championship fans. And, you know, when you do it the right way, the Sky Club on the roof, you got that. You got everything else that goes along with it. It is the premier spot for Alabama football watching and living right there next to uh, the uh, – the, the stadium itself, maybe the best college football stadium there is. All right, Tony, let's talk a little bit of football today. Alabama getting ready for Miami. Uh, I mean, we're, we're a ways from that, but practice, you got Bryce Young taking over. The offense we can talk about, I guess, because that's where I think the biggest question marks are. We're going to get into the defense, which I, looking at it on paper, might be the best defense Alabama's had just position by position as far as depth goes and experience and all that. Bryce Young takes over at quarterback. And that to me is the biggest question mark going into this season. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely going to be the, the question that's going to impact Alabama's success the most, I think, you know, because when you look at, is this offense going to be able to return to, you know, the standard that it was at last season, it, a lot of that does fall on Bryce Young's shoulders. I mean, um, the five-star talent, you know, the number one quarterback in his class last year. Um, we'll get to see what he can do. He looked really great during uh, A-Day when we saw him. He won MVP honors at A-Day. Um, it's really hard to judge what we saw from him in-game last season, but just because he came in exclusively during mop-up duty. So there wasn't a lot of – those situations can be tough to judge because you're coming in, you're, you're handing the ball off once, maybe handing it off twice, and then you're throwing on probably third and long because you're really just trying to wind down the clock at that point. So kind of hard to judge him, but based on what we saw this spring, really promising. Based on what we've been hearing and how he's done on seven-on-sevens, really promising. So we're expecting a lot from Bryce Young. Um, you know, I, I think he's going to be one of these guys that, you know, enters the season as a, as a Heisman favorite, even though he hasn't really played a, he hasn't started a game, but I think just because he's a, such a talented player on such a, a great team, I think, you know, he, he's going to be one of those guys in, in the early mix for that award. When you're Alabama's quarterback, you're always in the mix for a Heisman. Although Alabama's never had a quarterback win the Heisman. How about that, Tony? It's kind of weird, but you're exactly right. And you look at the betting odds. He's one of the favorites to win the Heisman. And yet he hasn't been a starter yet at Alabama. And he's also inheriting a bunch of receivers that are good and, and have a lot of talent, but it, they're not the, the superstars, at least not yet, that were there two years ago last year. I mean, you, you lose the, you know, the four giants that, that the Crimson Tide had, Ruggs and Waddle and Smitty, you know, and, and now all of a sudden, you know, you take over with, um, you know, I guess you got Slade Bolden with a lot of experience. And then, um, you know, Menchie, John Menchie, the third. I mean, he's the guy that comes in maybe as the, you know, the go-to target. A lot of question marks, though. I'm waiting for Javon Baker to maybe be a breakout star. All of the freshmen that just signed. What do you think? I think the name that you didn't mention, which is one that Alabama fans really need to know, is Jamison Williams. He's a transfer from Ohio State. And, Personally, I think he's going to be one of the biggest aspects to this offense. I, I think Nick Saban, you know, in the past, you know, you mentioned some of those guys, Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, um, Jalen. You know, Jalen Waddle started a little bit or played a little bit more as a freshman. But most of the time, Nick Saban, he goes with uh, with experience. And so you got guys like Jerry Judy that, you know, had kind of played in a reserve role his first year. I think you're going to get the same from some of those young guys. I think everyone's really excited about Aji Hall and, 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 you know, Jojo Earl and Christian Leary and, and that bunch right there. Right. But 
I think you're going to see the veterans play. So you're going to get John Mechie the third. You're going to get Slade Bolden. And here's where it comes in. I think Jamison Williams is going to be probably that third starter of the bunch. And mm -hmm. he really provides the speed that I think is going to open up the rest of this receiving core. Because John Mechie is not slow by any means, but he's not kind of the blow the top off fast guy that you've had with, you know, uh, Jalen Waddle or Henry Ruggs. The same with Slade Bolden. He's a capable, trusty option in the slot. But he's not going to really open up a defense the way that Jamison Williams is. He's got track star speed. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, having him on the perimeter, kind of maybe just running a go route, drawing out some of the defense, I think will open up the middle of the field for John Mechie, for Slade Bolden. And I think that's really what's going to open up this Alabama offense. Also, Jaleel Billingsley in the tight end slot. I just think that having that vertical, that home run threat is going to open it up. And it's not just going to be a decoy either. I think there's going to be plenty of times where, you know, Bryce Young, we've seen his ability to, to unleash a deep ball. I think you're going to see that, you know, some of those hit with, with Jamison Williams. And obviously he's not a one-trick pony either. He can go all across the middle and, and make some catches. And we've seen what Alabama can do with speed across the middle. So really excited about what he offers. And um, I think he's going to really help this offense. And in, in terms of being an influential piece, you know, might be one of the most influential outside of, you know, Bryce Young and then Evan Neal, who's, who's blocking for Bryce Young. Let me ask you this. What about some of the freshmen that are coming in, like Christian Leary? I mean, you talk about being able to blow the top off of a defense. That's what he brings to the table. Is there a chance that he's going to be able to get in and make an impact? Sure. I mean, there, there's a chance. I just think when you look at those guys, it typically takes a year for those guys to get used to it. Uh, they're going to have to get their blocking down. They haven't played college football. It, it, there's there's more to being a receiver than just, you know, catching and, and, and being fast. And so I think usually during the first year, I'm not saying it's impossible. Like I said, Waddle uh, played a lot during his freshman year. But I think that first year is almost like a developmental role where they can kind of get their feet wet. I think you start seeing some of that promise. Uh, we saw that through, you know, all of Alabama's young receivers, like, you know, turned into first rounders. We saw some promise in the in the first year, but they weren't necessarily called on to take on key roles. And so I, I, there's always a chance that one of those guys, you know, Ja'Cory Brooks, Iggy Hall, uh, Jojo Oral, Christian Lee, that they step into the starting rotation or break in there, but, you know, before the season's over. But, you know, I, I kind of see them starting off in a reserve role while guys like, John Mechie, Jameson Williams, Slade Bolden. You mentioned Javon Baker as well. They kind of, kind of know the offense a little bit more. They're a little bit more ahead, and so I, I give them the nod at the moment. It's going to be an entirely different look to Alabama's offense this year, just because they lost so many pieces from last season. And I look at last year's team, and I give the offensive line so much credit because they gave you know Mac Jones and and. Uh, you know, in the offense, so much time to operate. Bryce Young's a lot more mobile than Mac Jones. And, and a lot of people feel like he's got more talent because he can do so many different things. You know, the fact that he can run, he can throw on the run. I mean, he, you know, he, he's got that. And I mean, look, don't take it away from Mac Jones. He, he's got the deep ball too. But, um, you know, Bryce Young trying to figure out who's going to be his go-to guy early on. And Alabama starts this season against Miami. And uh, underrated, I mean, it's a 17-point spread Miami is a heavy underdog, but I'll tell you what, they bring back a lot of players. They couldn't stop the run last year, but you know what? I mean, like they've, they've gone out. They got a lot of these, these players back. They got their quarterback back. Uh, it just seems like for this young offense, it's, it's a really tough game to start out at. It'll always be challenging because, you know, you got inexperienced guys taking on bigger roles, but we've just seen this story so many times before, Mick. We've seen Alabama play, you know, who – you could be on paper a worthy opponent in the opener, and they always seem to make the spread. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Alabama just blows the doors off of, uh, off of Miami just because I just think that these are the kind of games when you give Nick Saban this much time to prepare for an opponent. And, um, you know, it's not like there's not talent on this Alabama offense either. So I, I see things, you know, there, there might be a miscue here or there, but Honestly, Miami's going to have those miscues too. I mean, it, everyone kind of has those that rust that they need to shake off. It's just really hard to beat Alabama in an opener. Um, I, I don't see it. Uh, I, I think it might be a good opportunity to get their feet wet and, and kind of hash some things out. I think it'll be a, probably a more worthy opponent was than than Duke was the last time 
uh, <laughs> they were in that stadium for an opener. That being said, I, I just don't think that it's going to be, you know, it, it's not going to be a, a close one. I don't think Alabama fans will have too much to worry about come the fourth quarter. I want to get into the two new SEC arrivals because that became official today. But just a couple more minutes on Alabama and their offense. You know, we're talking quarterbacks and running backs. uh, I mean, quarterback and receivers. But I got to get into running backs for a second because a lot of people feel like, you know, Brian Anderson, I mean, excuse me, Brian Robinson with all of that experience coming back is going to be the guy to keep an eye on. I feel like Chase McClellan, after watching him last year, is going to be hard to keep off the field. Um, I, I don't know that there's really, and, and you're around it every day, I don't know that there's really a, 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 a go-to running back. I feel like this is going to be more like Alabama in past years where, the hot hand's going to get the ball. You're going to see three or four different guys run. I just don't feel like, and this is just me personally, that Brian Robinson is a Najee Harris type guy. And we'll see. I think if there is going to be like what you would call a bell cow back, it, it would probably be Brian just because he's by far the most experienced. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I tend to agree that I don't really see there being that one guy that they go to. I think it's going to be more spread out. There's just so much talent in the unit. I mean, you mentioned Brian Robinson and Jace McClellan, but there's also Roydell Williams who had a great spring. Yep. And look, let's not forget about Trey Sanders. He's just the biggest wild card in this whole thing because personally, I think he might be the most talented out of that whole bunch. It's just, you know, what are they going to have him from him from an injury standpoint or from a, you know, how, how much will he be recovered? Um, from that hip injury, you know, but even if he's in a limited role, like a third down back, he could be a, a, a big option. I feel like there's going to be plenty of people touching the ball or they're going to spread it out a lot. We, we didn't even mention Kamar Wheaton, who comes in as the number one back in this year's class. Um, we've seen, you know, five-star kind of freshman running backs wait a year at Alabama before busting out. So don't be, you know, totally taken back if, if Kamar Wheaton doesn't do – too much this year um, but he's another talent to watch for the future as well um, I see Brian Robinson getting the majority of the carries probably Jace McClellan next but it, it could be close with you know with Roy Dell and Jace that that could be a battle for that number two spot I expect three to four probably leaning more to three running backs to be used in the in the mix um, you know and we'll see what happens with injuries and the fortunate thing for Alabama is they've got a lot of, you know, capable hands to, to go with at that position. And they're, they're so deep at running back uh, and they're all so good. So, I, I, I mean, um, that's that's one of the, the luxuries that uh, Bill O'Brien will have in this year's offense. We'll find out about the offensive line. Quickly touch on that before we talk about Oklahoma and Texas. We know Evan Neal is where I mean, look, this was the easy one. He's the guy that slides over and becomes the anchor of this offensive line. Everyone else I'm, I'm curious about, you know, what, what do we do from, you know, I mean, we feel like, okay, Eclair is going to be in a spot. This guy's going to be in a spot, but you got the Brocker Myers, you know, how are they going to look your thought on the offensive line right now? Well, Nick Saban kind of, kind of made my life, uh, you know, and everyone that's projecting his life a little bit easier uh, during SEC media days when he kind of, you know, it was an uncharacteristic thing for him to do, but he kind of announced that, you know, a, a starter, because he said that Jay Van Cohen is probably going to start. And he even gave us the position, which would be left guard. So, um, you know, it really kind of helped fill out the offensive line when you, when you look at it, if you if you do pencil in Jay Van Cohen at left guard, because then you got Evan Yett left tackle, Cohen at left guard. You would think that Chris Owens takes over the center spot. Uh, he's a leader on this team. He filled in nicely for Landon Dickerson at center during the playoffs. So we'll go ahead and pencil him in at center. Obviously, uh, Emil Echior would then take the right guard spot. Now we only have one more spot. It's right tackle. Now there's a lot of ways that Alabama can go. Did they go with a Damian George, who's just a monster big guy? Um, <laughs> saw him a little bit uh, during the spring. Do you go with uh, J.C. Latham, who's a five-star, that the crown jewel of Alabama's recruiting class? Uh, this year, uh, you mentioned Tommy Brockemeyer, another five-star tackle that could take that position. Uh, there's Tommy Brown. There's Kendall Randolph. Um, there's just a ton of names uh, of, of players that are all, you know, capable of of taking on that role. So it'd be really interesting to see, you know, 
kind of how Alabama goes for that right tackle spot. And, 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 you know, even though Nick Saban said that Javion Cohen was the left guard, I mean, they could change that up too. And so that, that could influence things, but it is looking like the offensive line is, is a lot more shaped up than it was this spring. And I, I think once you get that right tackle spot late, uh, you know, kind of projected or, you know, kind of feel comfortable there, I think you're going to really start to see this offensive line gel pretty well. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe as you watch Monday Night Quarterback here on Bama Insider and the Bama Insider YouTube channel brought to you by Westgate Luxury Condominiums right there next to Bryant-Denny Stadium in Tuscaloosa. He's Tony Sukalis. He's the Bama Insider beat writer. I'm Mick Gillespie. This is our first Monday Night Quarterback in a while. That tells you that football is right around the corner. And, Tony, we just added two new schools, two monster powerhouses to the SEC this is really going to change the dynamic of the conference. Maybe alignment will be different, but you're talking about two schools that when they come and play on your campus, it becomes a premier event with the Longhorns and the Sooners. This is really amazing to see how this SEC uh, is going to look in 2025 when these two join. Oh, it's, it's incredible. Uh, you know, the, you couldn't, I couldn't pick two better additions. I mean, you know, especially, you know, if you want to keep somewhat geographically, you know, in there. Um, I, I feel like, you know, from a brand name, these two, these two schools are really going to help out the conference. I mean, this is going to be the most powerful conference ever created. It's going to be really crazy to, to think that, you know, the SEC was already the premier conference. Adding brands like Oklahoma and Texas is just unthinkable almost. But, you know, I think these two teams um, – They've got a ways to go if they're going to compete. You know, I think Oklahoma's probably a little bit ahead of Texas right now. But I think once you add these teams into the SEC, and it's only going to help with their recruiting as well, I think you're going to see Texas kind of rise back up again. I, I'm not sure either of these teams are going to be able to compete with an Alabama Nick Saban. I don't think – shoot, very few teams can compete on a year-to-year -year basis with an Alabama Nick Saban. Eventually, though, it, you know, if, if Alabama were, you know, when, whenever Saban decides to step down, I think you're going to have a, a really interesting picture in the SEC because you're going to have a ton of names that, you know, Oklahoma, Texas, you know, let's not forget about LSU. They're going to be back. Uh, Alabama, Georgia, Auburn. You know, I mean, it's, it's Florida. I mean, so I, I think you could probably take the top 15 programs and what of them, 10 of them, you know, are probably going to be in the, the SEC now. It, it's pretty crazy uh, the amount of talent that's going to be in this conference moving forward yeah no doubt i you know i'm, I'm curious about how this is going to play out as far as conference alignment goes and you know do you do pods where you have four teams in in you know who you play or, or they split it and move alabama and auburn to the east that seems like it would be the easiest and then Texas and Oklahoma would be in the West, and maybe it's nine and nine. And is this it? Is it going to be? Are there going to maybe be more teams that are at it? You know, these are all questions that I'm kind of wondering, and I'm sure you are as well. Yeah, I mean, you kind of broke it down. Like, if you are going to move the two, it would make sense to move Alabama and Auburn. Then you wouldn't even have to worry about the Tennessee rivalry because everyone, everyone in that rivalry. Same with, with Auburn and Georgia. They would both, you know, kind of have their natural rivals. It would maybe make scheduling things a little bit easier as well. But I kind of like the pod idea. You know, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but I know that Alabama's pod, the one I saw projected, had Tennessee, Auburn, uh, Alabama, and Vanderbilt, I think it was. But the, 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 there was, like, all the pods, they made sense in terms of rivalries. I mean, look at that one right there. You'd have the Alabama – Tennessee rivalry and the Alabama Auburn rivalry. So that would be kind of taken care of. And then I'm sure you'd play teams, you know, also outside of your pod. Um, I think that that would just be kind of an interesting, you know, matchup. I think it would kind of create other rivalries too, because you'd have those, you know, it would just hype up the, the, the teams that are in their pods. Um, it's probably a good way to manage 16 teams is, is a lot. So it, it's kind of difficult to manage that with split divisions uh, so maybe the pods makes that easier um it's, you know it's almost like divisions in, in nfl and, and the more and more you know we haven't talked about the expanded playoff but like it seems like college football is starting to look a little bit more like the nfl so this pod idea might just add to that i don't hate it though um it really kind of interests me i think you know Better minds than mine will, will probably make that decision, but I, I could I could be swayed towards this pod system. I think it's it's kind of an interesting look.
I just wonder when it's too much. You know, when when is it spread too thin? You know, like um, is this eventually going to get so big that you know the SEC kind of loses its footprint? I mean, I, I get it. You get Texas and you get Oklahoma, and those are two awesome brands, but you didn't get rid of anyone. So you know, now you and I said nine and nine, eight and eight would be you know eight on one side, eight on the other. The eight on on the West, when you put those two in there and take Alabama and Auburn out, looks like the old what South Southwest Conference or whatever it was, you know, going old school. And then the old SEC looks like, you know, Alabama and Auburn in the East, you know. And I don't even know if that's going to last. I, I was so surprised by this that it's hard to really have an idea of where this is going other than the TV revenue is going to be off the chart adding these two schools and there's going to be a ton of excitement to have Alabama go to Oklahoma or Oklahoma come to Alabama, vice versa with Texas and, and any school in the league, when you're trying to sell tickets, you're adding two superstar attractions. And when you look at the big 12 and if you're Oklahoma and Texas, there's besides playing each other and they play each other in Dallas. So there's not even on campus games. There's no other game that you have. That's even close to what you're going to get when you bring in Alabama, Auburn, Florida, Tennessee. You know, you go to LSU. I mean, like they just made their team a lot more attractive. Forget about the TV aspect of it. Just showing up and watching football. So that's cool. I like that. Yeah. And when you look at some of the rivalries, I mean, uh, you're going to have the not only are you going to have the Iron Bowl, but now you're going to have the Red River rivalry. Uh, so it just adds another big rivalry. You're going to have uh, UT versus Tex- Texas A&M, which is a rivalry that will get back yeah. now because they'll be in the same conference. So, I mean, those are two more rivalries in two more huge games um, that you're adding to this conference that already has, you know, the, the, you know Tennessee, Alabama, uh, Alabama, LSU, um, you know, the Iron Bowl, you know, Auburn, Georgia, Right. Know, the cocktail party. There's so many of these games that are huge, and you just added two more must-see ones to, to the mix. It's just, it's just crazy. As for you know how to manage it, uh, maybe there won't be an East and a West now. Maybe it'll just be like pulled the pulled pork division and the uh, and, and and the brisket division. You know, uh, right, right. Like that. Uh, it, it, because it, you're starting to you know. It, the, you're gonna start to throw geographical terms out the window when you start adding more and more teams. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be fun to see how this all plays out. Well, Tony, looking forward to talking to you more on Monday Night Quarterback and a lot of our other shows as we get things ramped up. Alabama and Miami is opening kickoff uh, or is opening day, I was going to say, but it's the opening kickoff for the Crimson Tide. And, you know, we're closing in on that just, you know, about a month away. It's exciting, man. Like this time of year is is always awesome. Alabama right out of the shoot plays one of their – Biggest rivals outside of the SEC and a team they don't play a lot, but they've had some classic games against Miami. There's not a love loss between these two teams. I think Miami's going to come in ready to play against Alabama, and we'll keep everyone updated on how camp's going and as Alabama prepares for the Hurricanes. Hey, thanks for jumping on, man, and and, and you keep on doing the good work at Bama Insider, and you can read Tony's work at BamaInsider.com. 